I don't know if it uh, says something about me, but they gave me two glasses of water this morning, so there is two up here, right? Yeah, I just want to make sure. Okay, they're not seeing double. I got a, I got a little quiz for you this morning to start out. Tell me what these actors have in common. James Earl Jones, Jim Carrey, there's a little difference there, Patrick Stewart, and Bill Murray. Okay, let me add a few others. George C. Scott, Cecily Tyson, Tom Hanks. One more, one more hint. Finally, probably one of the greatest actors of our generation, Scrooge McDuck. All of these outstanding thespians and thespiducks have had the honor of playing the role of Scrooge in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. It's probably the most famous Christmas story outside of the Bible, and it's been retold countless times because it's a timeless story about looking back, looking forward, and most importantly about redemption. In one fateful night, Scrooge is confronted by his past, his present, and his future for all the purpose of helping him change his greedy ways and catch the Christmas spirit. And his companions for this journey are three ghosts, each with their own personalities and purposes. Now, all that being said, let me ask you, how's your Christmas spirit going so far this year? I think if you're like me, the ongoing rush of the holidays has me feeling a little more Scrooge-ish than usual. I guess if I'm honest, I have to also say that it has to do with the Lynn being in Georgia and me being here, and maybe just a little fall I took uh, about a week ago. So, maybe we need some ghosts ourselves to help us open up our hearts to truly what is coming this Christmas. For our Advent sermon series this year, we're going to be spending some time with Scrooge as we peer into the past, the present, and the future, as we yearn for what is yet to come. Kind of like our stewardship campaign this year, except we're not going to ask you to fill out any more pledge cards. As the story goes, Ghosts were able to help change Scrooge's focus from the pull of materialism and money to the true spirit of Christmas. The ghosts did it for Scrooge in one night. Uh, we're going to be taking a bit, little bit longer. We're going to take four weeks. If you're not familiar with the story, I'm very, be very surprised, but just to give you a, a quick synopsis, Ebenezer Scrooge is a miserly old man whose love of money has left him leading a very lonely life. Charles Dickens describes him this way. He was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching covetous old sinner. Yikes. Not a pleasant description in any language. He mistreats his employee, Bob Cratchit. He dismisses an invitation to his nephew Fred's Christmas party with a, scrowl, a scowling humbug. And on Christmas Eve, Scrooge is visited by the ghost of his former partner, Jacob Marley. Scrooge learns that Marley has been condemned to walk the earth carrying heavy chains because of the greedy life that he led. Yeah, we almost start to sound like a stewardship sermon, isn't it? It's not. Marley warns Scrooge to avoid the same fate and says that three ghosts will be visiting him that night. The first ghost is the ghost of Christmas past. A strange childlike phantom with a brightly glowing head. The spirit escorts Scrooge on a journey into the past to previous Christmases from the curmudgeon's earlier years. Some were wonderful memories. Some weren't so great. 
There was a Christmas he spent in school alone. There was the Christmas his sister escorted him home. There was the Christmas party that he had at old Fezziwigs, a former jolly boss. And there was his engagement to Belle, a woman who leaves Scrooge because his love of money was greater than his love for her. Scrooge is, is moved to tears by both the joy and the regret he experiences. I don't know about you, but I think at some point we've all felt the same way when we think about our past Christmases. There are memories that fill us with happiness and memories that we'd probably just as soon forget. Sometimes those memories are in the decorations themselves. We'll put up the Christmas tree and each ornament carries a, a story with it. We have ornaments that were given to us when we were little by relatives that now are gone. My mom had many such ornaments and when I look at those that I've inherited from her today, I'm reminded of her, of her faith and her love. And I miss her. <laughs> then we have ornaments marking rites of passages, baby's first Christmas, or handmade ornaments from our children when they were little. Delenn has some that Austin and Danielle and Jackie made when they were very, very young, and they are just awful. <laughs> I have one from my daughter Kristen, though, is... <coughs> just as awful, <laughs> but not when you connect them to the memories that they elicit. Just putting up a tree can be a trip down memory lane. And like Scrooge, we too can be moved to tears by both the joy and the regret of our past. See, that's the kind of power that our memories hold over us. Our, our past can shape how we perceive the present and how we move forward into the future. For Scrooge, his complex past shaped who he was and how he lived. As his love for money developed at an early age, calcified his heart, and actually his ability to love others. The past has the same power for Joseph in our scripture passage. He was committed to marry Joseph. Excuse me, he was committed to marry Mary, of course, only to find out that she returns from a trip that she is four months along in a pregnancy initiated by the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I can imagine the conversation going something like this. Oh, honey, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. The, good, the bad news is I'm pregnant and you're not the father. But the good news, neither is anybody else. Now, if you were Joseph, how would you respond to this? Now, he wasn't quite sure what happened with Mary. He only knew it had nothing to do with him. So, he faced a decision. What to do with Mary and her unborn child? We are told that Joseph was a righteous man, which means in Jewish tradition that he was a faithful follower of God's law and the law gave him two options. First, first option, he could follow what was laid out in Deuteronomy chapter 22 which says if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife both the man and the woman he slept with must be put to death. So one of Joseph's options is to expose Mary's apparent transgression and have her stoned to death. But the truth is, by New Testament times, that particular punishment was rarely meted out. Therefore, the only other option Joseph faced, according to the law, was divorce. No matter how much he loved Mary, it was his religious obligation to end the relationship and sever the marriage contract. He could honor the shaming dictated by the law and expose Mary's sin through a public divorce, humiliating her in front of her family and friends and leaving her future in question. Or he could divorce her quietly, 
with only a few witnesses doing everything he could to keep both his and Mary's reputation intact. But one thing was certain. He couldn't stay with her. It was just a mess for Joseph. He knew he would forever be defined by this transgression. From this point forward, he'll be known as the guy whose soon-to-be wife got pregnant. You see, it only took a split second to change his life for the worse. And he didn't even have anything to do with it. I know a lot of people whose lives have been changed by one bad decision. You probably do too. I have a friend who lost his job, his house, and even a lot of his friends, all because of a bad choice he made. It's all it takes, right? We all have at least one thing in our past that we regret. A memory that may haunt us, a decision that we would give anything to undo. Even if we've survived the consequences of it, we still know what happened. And we can never go back and change it. I remember when I was married to my first wife. She was pregnant. I actually quit my job. I pretended to go to work for about a week so she wouldn't know. I look back at what I did and I can't believe how senseless an act it was. My wife was pregnant, I quit my job, lost our insurance. How could I do such a thing? I realized I was a quitter. And then just one month later, just days after Christmas, our daughter was stillborn. The power of the past. Scrooge re weeps with regret when he realizes how his greed ruined his relationships. Joseph agonizes over what to do about his situation, whether to follow the laws of the past or trust what the angel is telling him about the future. Do we have to be who we've been? Are we beholden in the ways of the past? There's a Christian rock group called Reliant K that has a song called Who I Am Hates Who I've Been. But there's good news. There's good news for us, just as there was for Scrooge and for Joseph. The God we worship is not only a God of the future, and a God of the present, but also a God of the past, which means God's forgiveness stretches backwards and forwards, covering our past actions and altering how the shape of our lives are to be. We do not have to be who we were. We can choose to act like we were, to act as if the mistakes we have made still plague us, still define us. Or, we can have hope. Hope that God can work through our past to redefine our present and open up our future. Hope that we are not limited to either staying the same or running from the past. Hope that God presents another option to help us claim who we were as part of becoming who God has created us to be. Yes, the truth is, most of my life I quit jobs that I had. I quit on relationships I was in. I never had a job that lasted more than five years. Most were much less than that. I never had a romantic relationship for more than two years until I came here. Today is my 17th anniversary of being here at Santa Teresa Hills. <laughs> Truth be told, I didn't think I'd be here more than five. <laughs> and I married the love of my life to whom I have been married for 16 years, four months, and 10 days. So which person am I? The quitter? 
the one who made mistake after mistake, or the one who tried to learn from them and move forward. You know, it depends on where I put my focus, I guess. Yes, we've all made mistakes. And those mistakes are a part of our story, but they don't have to be the whole story. Scrooge let himself be defined by his past, but that's only one part of the story. We can reframe our past regrets as a small part of a larger story of forgiveness and growth. God has something greater planned for us. I liken the situation to that of driving a car. If you want to know what's behind you, you've got a couple of mirrors that you can look at. Side mirrors and a rear view mirror give you a small glimpse, glimpse of where you've been. But the truth is, if we spend too much time looking in our rear view mirrors, we miss what's coming ahead. I think there's a reason that our rear view mirrors are so small and that that, that mirror, that windshield is so spacious. It's important to glimpse at the past every once in a while, to know where we've been, but it's much more important to stay focused on what's in front of us. We were meant to spend most of our time looking ahead, not behind. For Scrooge, the ghost of Christmas past reminded him of the pain of his actions, caused as a way of setting the stage for him to look forward. For Joseph, the angel showed him that this one action of Mary's pregnancy, so condemned by society, doesn't have to keep him from doing the right thing. And for us, the birth of the Christ child brings with it hope. The hope that our past doesn't have to be our present and that our future is pregnant with a possibility that God has given to us. <coughs> so what will Christmas bring this year? More painful memories? More staring in the rear view mirror? Or will we look through our windshield at the hope the Christ child brings? Scrooge still has two more ghosts to go before his transformation is complete. But ours can start right now. You are not defined by who you used to be. You don't have to be a prisoner to the past, because you see, with God's help, you and I can start rewriting our new stories. And with God as the author, what stories they can be. May we each be open to what God has planned for us. Amen. Amen.